Kia ora, welcome to our webinar. We'll just give um, people a few minutes to join. I can see people are starting to rock in now, so um, just give everybody a minute or two. I'm hoping that my screen sharing is working. Um, it's looking good. Excellent. Okay, so we might make a start. I'm sure there's a few still to come, but um, don't want to keep those that have arrived on time waiting. So, um, kia ora tato, welcome to today's webinar. Ko Belinda Mathers toko ingoa. I'm really pleased to welcome Rod Oram to join us today. Um, there will be opportunity for Q&A um, at the end of the, the session, so drop your questions into the Q&A using the button at the bottom of your screen um, throughout the, the um webinar and we will answer all those that we have time to at the end. So I will just kick off with a karakia. Um, e te whānau, whaia kia marama, kia whai take i roto i ao mahi katoa, kia tū, kia kaha, kia hora te marino, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou kia tātou katoa. Okay, so welcome, Rod. Um, we caught up when we were at COP um, a couple of weeks now ago, nearly. Um, and good to see that you got back safely, um, coming back to the real world after um, a time in that sort of hothouse environment is kind of interesting, isn't it? So um, it's been good to get back into things. Yeah, kia ora, Belinda. It's great to uh, see you again. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, because uh, needless to say, we both uh, did a very riveting experience at COP and are keen to share our thoughts with you. Absolutely. So Antonio Guterres, the um, Secretary General of the United Nations, isn't known for mincing his words when it comes to anything, really. But um, particularly he's made some quite clear statements around climate change over the years. Um, so I think at the opening to COP, he um, made the statement that greenhouse gas emissions keep growing, global temperatures keep rising, and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irre irreversible. We're on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator which uh, is a very strong statement. Um, we're now at, I believe, 1.15 degrees of warming. Um, and it's really clear to all of us that um, are thinking about this space that big changes are needed to avoid catastrophic climate change. Um, so we're going to talk a bit today about what the role of COPs are in, in making that happen. Uh, were you at, the, at COP at this stage when... Um, Antonio Guterres made this statement, Rod, or were you monitoring yeah, it at that stage? Yes, I was. Um, and um, it, as ever, he focuses minds really effectively. Um, I mean, there's no arguing with the um, analysis he gives, um, and there's no hiding from the clarity that he delivers. Absolutely. So starting with the basics um, might be covering material that people already know, but um, it's good to remind ourselves. So we talk about COPs and um, the COP is the conference of the parties and the, the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, the 
even the abbreviation is quite long, UNF Triple C, um, which has been around for, for 30 years now, um, aiming to, to uh, combat dangerous human interference with the climate system. So um, absolutely focusing on that impact that we have on, on the climate. And um, as the name clearly states, the COP27 is the 27th meeting of the, the parties. Um, almost every country in the world is a signatory or is a party to the, the convention. Um, I think I could only find a, four mentioned that weren't in their places like Iran and Yemen and Eritrea and, and um, Libya or somewhere like that. So all the, the big countries um, around the world are part of it. And um, yeah, I guess it does give a, a good um, structure for, for getting things going and getting conversations happening in this space. So the, the purpose of COPs, um, as I understand it, is to review sort of global progress towards that overall goal um, and to review contributions of each of the parties. Uh, and the negotiations that happen are, um, around what different countries' shares are, I guess, to some extent, but also sort of nailing down some of the, the frameworks and processes um, around how that might happen. Um, Rod, What's your experience of the, the purposes of COP and um, maybe how they've changed over the years too? Um, the big change over the years, and this is drawing on other people's knowledge because um, this was only my uh, second COP in person, although I had been following them for some years, is that the years have gone on, it's broadened out from just government negotiators meeting to progress things. And even um, as somebody was telling me in, in Egypt, as recently as I think 2013 in Bali, um, the civil society proportion of COP was a lot smaller. Um, and it's really important that civil society um, uh, proportion has grown. So you've got the negotiations, um, but th those negotiations, if you like, are held in the COP upper of um, society. Um, and it's um, the great changes that are happening in society, both negative and positively, um, but the drivers of change um, and the people who are the real innovators that then are doing that on the ground, that are then helping to build public support and thus political support, that then eventually comes together at COP. Um, and because everything in COP has to be agreed by every country, that's a very difficult process. You imagine you've got um, Russia and the United States agreeing on something at this COP. Um, and you had in those negotiations, very intense negotiations and very big changes in countries' positions. So both the United States and China climbed down from their high horses about finance facilities for uh, loss and development for developing countries and signed up and got on board. So that's the power of COP. So you have to think of COP as that overarching global framework that brings coherence to what humanity is doing. And between COPs, there are all these extraordinary array of work programs that are advancing that. And then that has to sit um, and be held by civil society. And so civil society giving expression very viscerally and directly at COP is a very important part, which has grown hugely, hence 40,000 people this year. And I saw a reference a couple of nights ago to the UAE hosts of the next COP, um, next November, starting November 30th in Dubai, um, saying they're expecting 80,000 people there. Um, wow. So that's, that's the scale, but the essential dynamic. So never look to COP. Um, except for rare examples like Paris, of a huge breakthrough. It's about being able to draw all these threads together to create that unifying um, overarching framework. So terribly important, um, but it's not out there um, doing all the heavy lifting for us. No, absolutely. And I guess that brings us nicely, thank you, to uh, the, this slide, which does sort of overview the history of COPs since they started and where they all were. And um, when I was looking at this list, I guess it, it jumped out at me how few of them I really remember much stuff from. Um, so Kyoto, people know the Kyoto Protocol, people know the Paris Agreement. Um, there were achievements at all of the other COPs of different, you know, differing 
you know, magnitude, I guess, and different differing types. But yeah, as you say, we don't always um, sort of see everything that's happening as a major achievement. So, and um, there were some great things that came out of COP26 in Glasgow last year, uh, and there was discussion, um, I know, this year of actually a year is a really short time frame to see huge changes. Um, so this was more around implementation of some of the things that have come in in the past and tidying some things up further and agreeing some extra things. Um, um, yeah, can I just point out in that run is if we go back to COP3 in Kyoto, that's the essence of the Kyoto Protocol, which turned out to be a complete failure um, because it still pitted developed countries against developing and the US didn't sign up and there was all sorts of other problems. So you have to come all the way down to COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009, where we thought a new structure was on the table, which would break that logjam but it didn't happen until COP21 in Paris in 2015. And so, so that's how difficult this is. Um, and that's why you always have to look at um, the sort of the lineage through here, almost the fucker papa of COPs um, to understand these dynamics, you know, working through um, the world um, over um, now many decades. Mm. And it, it was something that I wasn't really aware until this COP of um, how they decide where different COPs are. So they do rotate around the diff six different regions of the United Nations. Um, so you know, this year was Africa's turn, last year was Europe's turn, um, next year is Middle East, um, and then one after that is Eastern Europe, I think followed by Latin America, Caribbean area. Um, Lula was suggesting that uh, mm. Brazil would be a great place to have that. Um, and then the year after that, um, it may end up um, down in our part of the world, possibly in Australia. So um, we're starting to get that picture of what's, at least where things are going to be for the next few years. Um, that, well, I guess, changes the flavour of, of the cops as well, to a certain extent. I think it's hugely important because we have the experience where the UN's um, big assembly every year is in the United Nations in New York. Um, and um, it, that fixed place has some benefits, um, but it also has some very dis great disadvantages because um, who is hosting um, brings a different focus, brings a different flavor. Um, and so, you know, Africa was palpably there even though we were tucked at a corner of the Sinai Peninsula in a kind of a very non-African place, if you like. Um, but lots of people from Africa there, it was very fully on the agenda. So I'm all for that rotation. I think that's actually fundamentally important to the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. What about New Zealand's role at COPS over the years, Rod? Um, you know, New Zealand's had quite a, um, a lead role at times in in this space. Um, have you got any observations about how that might have changed with time? Yes. Um, a consistent one is that um, true in other international fora like the World Trade Organization, elsewhere in the United Nations, um, across the place, we are a very small country and therefore we don't have, we can't push our own agenda, if you like. So we are considered honest brokers. We're considered um, pretty smart and realistic um, and capable diplomats. And so a lot of what happens is behind the scenes. And, it, and again, at this COP, it was hard to know exactly uh, we could see the official readout of who the formal meetings uh, James Shaw, our climate minister, was having with people each day. Um, but we have no idea uh, what the informal conversations that he was having with that might have helped shift minds, uh, although I know he's persuasive. But I'll give you one really big example. Um, and whilst um, we um, had some really big input into the Kyoto Protocol, it's what happened over the... Um, decade from the collapse of Copenhagen, where there was this huge search to find a completely different structure. What happened around about 2010, 2011, there was a climate um, conference up in the Pacific. And there in the Pacific, the idea got uh, raised about, well, what happened if just every country um, made its best commitment it could, put it on the table, aggregate that up, see where that got us, and, and then use that as a starting point. And so that concept 
was picked up by the New Zealand government, by Tim Grosser as the climate minister at the time, and worked up into the idea of nationally determined contributions and a fundamentally different approach. Um, so at Kyoto, that was a very classic um, legalistic, top-down, um, very rigid treaty. But Paris is extraordinary because it is voluntary, it's non-binding. So the whole uh, way it works is, if you like, a naming and shaming. Naming positively, but shaming um, the laggards. Um, and that's what drives it. And so um, New Zealand, and Grosser was very good at this, um, worked very hard with others to build up that concept to get it um, over the line at Paris. That would be um, our biggest contribution. Um, and it thrills me hugely that that was an idea that came out of the of, of Pacific Climate Forum uh, now more than a decade ago. And I've talked to people who were at that forum and, and have heard how that started. Um, so we can't do that every year. Um, and so it's up to us um, to play a role where we can. Um, but again, it, I come back to that idea we are a small, this dynamic, we are a small country, we are respected, but with it comes an obligation to actually deliver ourselves. We won't have credibility in that role unless we are doing really credible things. And I'm worried that we aren't um, actually living up to that here in New Zealand now. Um, and that's a very big thing we have to work on if we want to continue to have um, a plausible, credible role in COP. Absolutely. So moving on to, to why we were there, it's a really long way to go. And I know I had, I had numerous conversations um, internally within Toitu going, you know, am I comfortable with the emissions that this travel will create? And you know, what do I need to do um, while I'm there to make those emissions worthwhile? Um, because those are the sorts of conversations we have. And, uh, and I said, look, I'm not willing to go unless my attendance there is going to be useful, um, both there and once I get back. So um, while I was there, I did, I did do a couple of panel presentations. Randomly, I ended up as um, my, the badge that I got to attend um, COP was through the Italian pavilion, and I, because I was doing a couple of presentations in the Italian pavilion um, on our programs, how we're meeting best practice, how we're aligning with the standards, those sorts of things. Um, also, you know, sharing knowledge, meeting with um, people that um, or potential partners or existing partners um, that are working in similar areas or adjacent areas to us, um, building those relationships that are actually really hard to build from the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we try really hard to, to do that stuff, but when we're constantly trying to attend webinars at two in the morning, um, it's quite hard to build relationships that way. Um, and I also went with the goal of getting some insights from the global um, players around voluntary carbon markets, because we have a huge need in New Zealand for a, a robust voluntary carbon market um, that you know, business can be um, sort of part of and using. And But New Zealand's in a really unique situation. So I went and picked the brains of some of the, the big standards, um, the different um, industry bodies and those sorts of things sometimes with MFE sitting alongside me and sometimes um, they weren't able to attend because they're in the middle of negotiations so I was sort of channeling them and asking you know, asking the questions that I thought needed to be asked so I think that it, it was useful from my my perspective or from from Toy Toy's perspective me being there on a personal level it was you know massively interesting um it, you know, it was just a, a fascinating thing to be part of for the first time so um i guess that's why we decided to be there it's only the second time we've had somebody from toy to attending cop um and the second time you said you've been to cop rod so what were your drivers to be there in person oh very straightforwardly um there is um given the state of media in new zealand um um uh, I, I was at this COP, uh, the only New Zealand-based um, journalist there. There was a, a stringer um, uh, who uh, feeds into radio stations here, who's based in Spain, um, and uh, it was th thus the two of us. And so to me, it's just hugely important, selfishly, for my own understanding, and I learn a lot. And in addition to all of those things you're identifying there, for me, kind of the magic of any kind of 
get gathering but in particular this is the sheer serendipitous nature of who you run into and um, that somebody that you'd never ever meet and, and you learn something you'd never ever thought about before and um, and i was having those sort of brief conversations every day because people are intensely focused and everybody is very purposeful you know who are you what do you want what can you tell me what can I tell you uh, and, and people are in a sense quite brisk in this because there's a lot of people to see in a very short time and that so it's fantastically efficient um, but wonderfully serendipitous so that's hugely important and um, so um, for me my um, goal um, simply as a journalist um, is try to be to convey some sense of what this is all about and what it means to us in New Zealand and to do that in, in a very direct way um, you, you know what's what's the tough words that have to be had but what are the encouraging words as well and um, so in, in essence um, my role is as straightforward as that. And um, are there any particular interactions that you had with um, individuals, some of these serendipitous meetings that um, come to mind that would be interesting for the I, I want to have? very briefly tell you two. <laughs> the first one is um, on a bus home from Cot one night, shuttle bus, um, I was chatting to the person next to me, George, from Kenya. And for 20 years, he had been a national MP from his area alongside Lake Victoria, to the national parliament in Nairobi. But late in his career, um, he had this big realization that in a country like his, um, you don't get that flow of money and support and skill flowing down from central government through regional to local government, you're kind of on your own in local government. And so his county, as they colonially still call their local um, organizations, 1.2 million people on the shores of Lake Victoria. And because of climate change, heavy rain up in the hills behind, so the level of Lake Victoria had risen two meters. But drought um, at Lake Victoria. So for 20 or 30 kilometers back from Lake Victoria up into the hills, drought. Some of his pastoral farmers had had no rain in three years, losing all their animals. And he had come to COP to talk to NGOs and to uh, find people with similar experiences so he could learn and take that back um, to his 1.2 million people. And, and that to me is uh, the huge benefit of COP is that absolutely hooey of humanity uh, that comes together. Very briefly, another story, again, a Kenyan story, um, actually an American, a young American, been working in East Africa for 10 years, getting solar powered fridges and stoves and uh, lights and the rest to unbanked people, i.e. poor people without banks. And, and now the new thing is electric motorbikes to replace petrol driven ones, which are prodigious polluters and, and finding ways to um, work with those assets that people can actually reduce the cost of ownership um, and uh, running of those electric motorbikes by about 30% over a petrol driven one. And the capital that's in there, the company is called M Copa, um, M hyphen K-O-P-A, um, has all sorts of fascinating capital in there. Yes, there is uh, philanthropic venture capital in there, such as Al Gore's Generation Investments Company, um, but also increasingly commercial finance in there because they're building that asset base using the Internet of Things to track each electric motorbike's battery and charging and everything else, and then working on being able to sell negative emissions, i.e. foregone emissions, as a way of bolstering that financial model. Um, so for me, this, that, those two Kenyan stories um, captured a, a great deal of the reality on the ground, mm. um, uh, which um, I think is, is completely extraordinary. Um, and then a third one um, was again from East Africa. Uh, Green Faith is a US-based um, Christian climate movement, very active around the world, particularly in Africa. And um, I had dinner one night with uh, the 25 people, they happened to be staying in the same hotel as me, um, from Green Faith. And it was just completely extraordinary to hear about their campaigning in various countries across Africa. Um, people very committed, very knowledgeable, very bold, um, making a big difference in their communities. 
Yeah, there's just a whole world of people doing different interesting things out there, isn't there? And they have different needs. You know, it really opened my mind, again, as travel does, of, you know, how narrow it's easy for our viewpoints to become um, and how important it is to open up our, our minds and our perspectives on things. I, I know we need to be very conscious of time. May I add one more vignette? Because it's a really sure. important one. Um, as a journalist, I can uh, not get into almost all the negotiations. But on the day before COP officially started, the first Saturday, I found myself wandering around taking, trying to take pictures of plenary sessions. I found in the main plenary room, seats about 3,000 people, about 200 people sitting right at the front. And they were trying to progress um, this work of the subsidiary bodies. These are um, all the work streams um, working on stuff that COP has already agreed. And, and they were really stuck because they have to, under Rule 16, apparently, have to be unanimous in what they pass up to the presidency for further action. And so the delegate from Mexico was, was refusing to come on board. There was something about Mexico's um, national adaptation plan. I, I wasn't there to hear the whole conversation. And, and um, um, the wonderful chair was a woman called Marianne um, uh, Carlson from Norway. Uh, I think she's um, only about in her 40s, perhaps um, a veteran diplomat of over 20 years, was very thoughtfully and, and in supporting ways trying to bring Mexico along. And then so many other countries were kind of trying to come around Mexico to encourage them to come along. They didn't succeed. That work didn't progress. And it was a real privilege to spend that little time there on the Saturday afternoon, the, the UN security guards, um, you know, American style police uniform, pistols on their hips, uh, because it hadn't officially started and this was a kind of a low grade session, they let me go in for a little while. And it was just that extraordinary little insight about how the dynamics of these negotiations work. Mm -hmm. and, and that was just a tiny example um, that um, multiplies up. Um, across um, the intensity of the issues and the breadth of discussions um, culminating in the closing plenary that culminated at the end of a third night of all night negotiations, starting at 4 a.m. on the Sunday morning and finishing at 9.20 a.m. on the Sunday morning, um, uh, uh, best part of 36 hours late. Um, so that's how intense it all gets. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thinking about who was there from New Zealand, um, it was a little bit hard to work out exactly how many New Zealanders were there because um, just because of the way badging works and all those sorts of things. Um, so there, I think there were about 40 or 50 of us there. There were, were, I think, sort of 12 or so in 12 to 15 in the official delegation, the government delegation. Um, and then there were other government representatives from MFE and MPI and, and MFAT, quite a number of MFAT, as you'd expect. Um, a few business representatives, not a lot, really. Um, quite a few NGOs um, were well, New Zealanders involved in NGOs of different types, different organisations, um, lobbying or you know putting their perspectives forward on things, yet very small press contingent, and you um, were busy trying to keep on top of everything going on there, I'm sure, Rod, and a few others. So um, the photo there is from the farewell event that was held for Helen Plume, who is a, a extremely long serving and um, highly performing um, mm. person in this space for New Zealand. She's um, had a um, an official honour for, for it and she's been to all but one cop so I quite like this official photo that um, it's a number of New Zealanders and a few others that were obviously at that event which I wasn't at of course but um, yeah any perspectives from you Rod on New Zealand's representation and um, you know how effective that is or, or how that might be different moving forward? Yeah, and starting in the very big picture, there's quite a Kiwi diaspora um, working in all sorts of organizations, um, business, um, even advisors in other governments and the rest. And it was wonderful running into people like that. 
Um, also very good NGO representation, um, although this was the first year for many years our government handed, hadn't funded youth delegates, um, and so um, there was um, some very brave Rangatahi Māori um, who had um, had to scrape together the money from friends, family and others to get there, um, who played um, good roles. Um, Caden Wells uh, was one of those people, I interviewed him. Um, Business representatives, I could count that pretty accurately on um, the fingers of one hand uh, and still have some fingers left over. So, for example, um, Fonterra didn't send anybody this year, even though it and its farmers are responsible for 21 percent of our emissions. Um, and um, uh, so very, uh, uh, very, very light on the business side. Now, the plan is, the Sustainable Business Council tells me, to have a big push at Doha next year. Um, sorry, in Dubai next year. But um, they'd be coming at that really cold. Um, and um, I think that's a mistake in itself. But you have to build up a track record. And um, I'm still finding um, New Zealand businesses, while um, our best are reasonably well locked onto the issues, um, still um, not anywhere nearly deeply and uh, insightfully plugged into the real best of global leadership in their sectors uh, than they need to be. So as a business journalist, um, of course, that worries me considerably. Um, 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 but I mean that in the, the broadest sense, because business does have a crucial role to play, but business also has to work within the sort of um, be held in the cup of our society, a social license, if you like. Um, and therefore, I think it's really, really important um, for people in business here to understand um, better how these dynamics are playing out um, in the global context and learn from that and contribute to that. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the insights that I gained um, from a business perspective, because I went with my business hat on, I suppose, um, it was really interesting to, to see. And I'll talk a, a, about some of them in, in a couple of slides time. But um, yeah, absolutely. I think going there as a business representative, you get some really interesting perspectives on what's going on, what could happen, what's easy, what's hard, um, and what's best practice. So I found it really motivating in that way. Yeah. So in terms of the key negotiations, there's um, been a bit in the, the media globally around, you know, was it a good outcome or was it a bad outcome? Um, I think definitely the, the loss and damage piece is what this COP will most likely be remembered for. So it's the first time loss and damage has really made it onto the, the table um, as a, a something that needs to be managed. And the, the process hasn't been completed there, but at least a, an agreement has been made to um, create a fund for loss and damage um, so that the, the countries that have caused the problem historically um, are supporting the the solutions in countries that are most affected in those those poorest countries, um, and there was some some progress in some other areas. Um, but yeah, keen to get your insights, Rod, on um, sort of what happens in negotiations from your perspective, but also what the the key outcomes and any big disappointments for you were. Yeah, the loss and damage one is really important um, because it's the first time it had been officially on the agenda um, and it took 40 hours of pre-talks um, there in Sharm el-Sheikh before the um, COP actually kicked off on the Sunday to get it on the agenda. So a tremendous push by developing countries, Group of 77 plus China uh, and others. Um, but it's really important what's been agreed because it's Big, it's, it's the first time we're starting to see a way to bring developed and developing countries together, a split that goes all the way back to the Kyoto Protocol um, 30 years ago. Um, so that's terribly important. But next important is by um, UNFCCC um, timetables, this is quick. So they have to come back next year, COP28, with a very fully fledged plan of how this works uh, with money starting to flow the following year. But even better, 
And this is seen in the context of a much bigger picture, not just about government money flowing for this, but um, there was very big references to and um, pushes for some very big overhauls of the global financial system to make it more possible for private sector capital, uh, both commercial and philanthropic, um, to get alongside this. So um, it's not just about government money um, for loss and damage. It's also about increasing that um, significantly to get us to trillions of dollars of money that has to flow into developing countries and to get them um, through these transitions, these huge transformations, and so they can escape the worst of climate. And so that's why the loss and damage is so important. Um, I, um, I, I, won't, I wasn't following carbon markets that closely. Um, mitigation, um, yes, of course, there was not enough on that. Yes, one and a half degrees is sort of still there, but the, those two went slightly backwards. Actually, I think fundamentally backwards in one sense, and um, because we ended up in Glasgow with a phasing uh, down of coal, India was fingered as the culprit in that. Um, they felt hard done by that. They came back to this COP arguing for a phase out of all fossil fuels, and uh, that didn't get through. And then some very difficult language, some very dangerous language got in and it's new words about the role of low emissions energy. So that's slightly coded word for fossil fuels, particularly gas. And that was clearly driven by the petrostates, um, which Egypt is one, it's got, a, it's a gas exporter. Um, it's got 55 domestic and foreign um, fossil fuel companies exploring in its land. Um, and of course, we move on to COP28 next year in Dubai, where the United Arab Emirates, very big exporter of oil and gas, um, is very keen on that language. It uses a lot about low emissions energy. Um, and so um, the um, huge disruptions caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, has obviously emboldened fossil fuel producers. So there is going to be one heck of a fight going on between now and then um, in COP28 next year to really push back very strongly about that. And as the, as the host, as the president of COP next year, um, the UAE um, has some influence, some power to shape that narrative. Although, of course, there'll be plenty of other countries um, pushing back against that. And so I think the negotiations next year will be even more intense. Mm. Um, but those were some of the key outcomes um, for me. I, I should just add another, a few other things. Um, oceans in the convention for the first time. Um, the, the human right to a healthy environment in the convention for a first time. Agriculture lifted up from basically a four year discussion about farmers, so subsistence farmers in developing countries, elevated to a whole global food system perspective, terribly important, particularly for us in New Zealand with our farmers. And so the, those were some of the other big themes there uh, where you see the, the power of the convention and the power of the negotiation um, elevating those issues, which are so fundamentally important. Uh, to humanity's overall response to climate. Yeah, and it is quite interesting that what people were talking about beforehand aren't ne weren't necessarily the areas yeah. that progressed the most yeah. during the course of the, the negotiations as well. So outside the negotiation side, there's always a bundle of um, initiatives and announcements and other bits and pieces that, that come out around, either around or at COP. Um, so there's a few sort of cover pages of different things that um, came out that might that are potentially relevant to business in New Zealand um, that is shown there. So the, the high-level ex expert group, um, which is appropriately named HLEG, apparently, um, is all about integrity and avoiding greenwash. Um, our own um, Rod Carr from the Climate Commission was on that, that group. And that's, from my perspective, a really good document. Um, mm. It's not going to be easy to, to achieve, but it, it covers um, you know, the importance of 
being really strong and transparent and not um, greenwashing in what we do. Um, ISO has issued its net zero guidelines. They, um, unlike most ISO things, this is free, which is actually really unusual, um, and was put together in a very short time frame for ISO as well. Um, and then there's a, a couple of others in there as well around how we're going um, in climate. The Climate Trace website is an interesting one. Uh, it's using satellite technology to um, look at po point sources of emissions uh, on a real-time basis. Uh, there are a bundle of New Zealand sort of sites on there. Do jump on that. that I think it's climatetrace.org, but it, if you just mm. Google Climate Trace, you'd find it there. Um, and you can sort of see where the biggest um, emission sources are around the world um, of different things. So I guess that makes it a little bit harder to hide from your emissions in some ways. Um, and Rod, I know you've been following the MSCI um, work over over time, and um, mm. you had some some thoughts on that one, I think, as well. Um, yes, um, there's lots and lots of things I track. Um, but MSCI, um, obviously one of the great uh, global sources of um, stock market data, they construct indices and the like. Um, their net zero tracker work, uh, I find very good. So um, uh, um, I won't trouble you with showing that. Well, no, perhaps I will, seeing as I ask for screen sharing privileges. So, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, well, I stopped my share uh, so you can start yours. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's this slide here. Um, so um, basically, we know how much more um, greenhouse gases we can put up there if there was a two degree target. Um, obviously, the target is much, much smaller for one and a half, incredibly big difference between the two, um, because one and a half is kind of, we can kind of cope with that, um, two, humanity can't. But the time left for stock market listed companies using their current fair share, I mean, their current share of emissions, um, before they run out of that one and a half degree budget um, is astonishingly short. This was in August, so we're now three months on, so that, but there's only 49 months left. So that means that in 49 months time, all of those stock market listed companies cannot emit a single ton more of carbon. That That's what one and a half degrees budget means. And you see how big the budget is for two degrees. Uh, it's a lot more. We don't have that time. And my, I think my central preoccupation from a business point of view, people are still not understanding that the timetable we're working to is set by the living systems of the earth, the climate systems, um, the biodiversity systems, the ecosystems and everything else. We actually have to pay attention to that. We have to work at that speed, which is now warp speed. But almost all companies, even those who are signed up to one and a half degrees, are still thinking about, well, we'll perhaps do this next year or in the next investment cycle or when our shareholders or our customers will let us to do that. No, no, no. You've, we've got to take... Um, we've got to take nature's timeline here because there it's in charge and um that's to me is the fundamental message i'm always trying to get across not just to businesses but government um you know anybody and everybody because it's a whole of society response but for me that that's how um intense and um exquisite um if you like exquisite <laughs> Uh, the whole thing is basically yeah. uh, to be blunt. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. We haven't got time to to be um, mucking around, have we? No. Um, but there were some other good things that were were mentioned as well, or um, were announced. Um, Indonesia is doing some really good work around um, closing coal fired power stations, which um, was I don't know whether that was expected, but um, no, yeah. it wasn't, and it's really important because. Um, it was sort of designed by um, the people who came around Indonesia and the Indonesians as something of a template to see how that loss and damage stroke um, transformation funding might work. 
Um, and it's so it's a really good example about um, bringing capital around um, the fast phase out. But th the really important thing around capital is we need a big shift in the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to bring their capital into the market for blended finance. So it's possible to de-risk the extraordinarily high uh, risk premium on investing in places like Africa, unreasonably high, um, to make it possible um, for more to crowd in um, more private and philanthropic capital. So the Indonesian um, example was a really, really important one. We hope to see a lot more of that sort of thing coming through over the next year or so. So some observations for business um, that I made, I mostly attended business focused um, presentations during the, the course of the, the COP. Um, business is absolutely key to the solution when business isn't going to do it on their own. We need enabling environments um, to be able to make it happen. But the climate problem will not be solved without business. Um, I really liked this slide that was shown by um, somebody from Nestle, and it, I thought it really reflected the challenges that all businesses are, are covering or are experiencing. So, you know, companies want to be doing measuring their emissions, setting targets, doing some real stuff to reduce their emissions, disclosing, you know, what it is that they're doing and proving that what you know that their progress is real and all those sorts of things. That's a kind of a pathway that um, is quite standard for organizations, but there's a whole lot of things that are making that difficult. Um, the around misalignment, around lack of data, around um, unclear frameworks, around lack of resource. You know, these are all things that we have experienced and we know our, our customer base are experiencing as well. So actually, while this is kind of depressing in some ways, it's really good to know that this is a universal problem and there is universal work going on to try and solve this. So there was a, a lot of talk at presentations that I attended around this is coming year is going to be a year of harmonization and alignment and collaboration to try and make this journey easier. Um, and, you know, Toitu is obviously aiming to be a big part of that um, in New Zealand and beyond as well. Um, Big focus on greenwash, that HLEG report, um, that's what that was all about, integrity and greenwash. Um, there was something that I was in that somebody was talking about high integrity and some somebody said, I didn't know there was high integrity and low integrity. I thought it was just integrity or not integrity, yes. uh, which yeah. is quite a nice observation too. And then the, the other one is that true business transformation is needed. Uh, you know, we're not at the point that we can be working around the edges anymore. Um, so it's real transformation, but the transition to our new way of working has to be a just transition. There was a lot of talk about just transition, and that was talking about, I guess, three different areas um, that I heard. One is for workers to make sure that workers aren't worse off at the end of the the transition or through the transition that those workers in sunset industries are reskilled to do things that they want to do and that they can do. Um, the uh, just transition for the highly vulnerable communities in the world, you know, a third of Pakistan flooded this year. Um, the, those people have lost their homes, they've lost their everything they own. Um, we need to have a transition, global transition that looks after them. And the other one is the voice of nature and making sure that we have um, just transition for nature and that nature is better off because, you know, as Rod, you said before, um, you know, nature is, you know, we are responding to nature here. <laughs> so, um, you know, if we're not making things better for nature, then nature is going to make things worse for us. So, um, I guess there were some key observations from a business perspective um, that I um, observed. Anything to add there, Rod? 
Uh, look, th that's all immensely helpful. And um, I'm no surprise that comes from Nestle because um, as the world's largest food producer and also incidentally Fonterra's largest single customer and dairy is its largest single ingredient, um, is incredibly focused on these issues and they have a great track record of delivering on what they say they're going to do. The one thing I'd add um, from a business perspective is um, it's astonishing in some sectors how fast this is going so I, i'm going to use the example of this two examples the first is the steel industry and um, so um carbon free steel making was um something of a dream even a year ago in glasgow um but we're now already getting um a couple of scandinavian makers using hydrogen in small quantity um but you've got one car maker volvo committed to building a particular model using that kind of steel. Um, and um, so those steel makers are responding um, very rapidly um, and an extraordinary um, scientific investment and everything else journey they're on. And um, the other example is uh, truly sustainable aviation fuels. And I don't mean bio-based ones, but um, synthetic molecules Best of all, ideally, using carbon um, monoxide or dioxide captured from the air. And um, so we're pulling it out of the air to create these synthetic fuels. And again, um, I was in a couple of sessions on sustainable aviation fuel and a very interesting example about um, how fast that work is progressing on um, the UK government um, Sorry, really important point. And um, the whole Jet Zero Council um, in the UK is literally end to end um, from government and fuel suppliers and aircraft makers and engine makers and airport operators and airlines. Um, um, and uh, very bold, very big investment plans. They will be announcing their decision because the RFP has been out for a while on um, the first plants um, and uh, to build sustainable aviation fuels. Now, those first plants will be um, the inadequate first generation, um, too much bio resource in there, whether it be waste material or whatever. Um, um, but that's, again, a very good example of getting everybody together um, in a, a value chain uh, or a, a a, to d derive a, a big climate solution. So I'm very excited um, to see that sort of um, quite revolutionary response um, from business. And again, we have got to be trying to achieve, not try, we've got to achieve um, a similar dynamic in our own economy um, with our really, really gnarly climate issues. Absolutely. And you're getting much closer to those um, closed loop processes. So mm. we're not mm. taking from the environment to create the things that we want or need in our lives. You know, if we're doing those things like sucking the, the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide out of the air, um, then that's, you know, mm. more of a closed loop system, which is absolutely the, the way we need to go. So Final slide, um, and this is a, a little bit of a, um, a contentious one, I suppose. So the International Chamber of Commerce made this statement um, at the closing of COP, and um, Rod and I were talking about this one, and we both agree that this is what needs to happen, um, but there's a huge risk that it ends up being greenwash. So you know, I guess any sort of further perspectives on how business does this without it being greenwashed, you know, makes it real. Yes, um, this is um, can only be considered um, an, an aspiration by the International Chamber of Commerce, who were very late, despite their name, very heavily US-based, uh, very late getting to climate, very resistant for a long time. Um, and the global business community stands resolutely and squarely behind the goal of achieving 1.5 is plain not true, um, because fossil fuel producers aren't. You know, they will talk about we're part of the solution, um, but we know that's utterly illogical. But the really, really crucial thing, though, here is to um, pick your partners very carefully because there are fantastic partners out there. Uh, however modest your goal is, uh, however small your business is here in New Zealand, 
um, there are the right people to partner who who will be with you on that journey, who can um, teach you a lot, but you as you progress will be able to teach them a lot um, and that do have real credibility. Um, and so it's really important to pick those partners carefully. And um, at a very global level, um, you get organizations like uh, We Mean Business um, out of Europe, um, or that uh, the works closely with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, the Sustainable Business um, Council here, part of Business New Zealand, um, is plugged into World Business Council for Sustainable Development, um, but the rest of Business New Zealand is more problematic on that. Um, and at a small scale, um, the Sustainable Business Network is very effective. Um, but then in terms of really, really big systems thinking going on, the World Economic Forum um, is actually a real leader on this. One can be, can be rightly cynical about the World Economic Forum in some respects, but that's unfair. There's been a huge change of culture and mission in the World Economic Forum over recent years. And, and so, for example, they are doing some really fabulous leading work on um, the uh, sort of reimagining, re uh, repurposing the global food system, for example. They're working across many other areas too. So it's really, really important, um, not just as a first step, but to constantly be tracking as you're working on this in your own organization, just to be scanning all the time, who are the best people out there? Who are the most credible people um, that I can collaborate with? And that to me is, is kind of the absolute heart of all this because those are the people um, who will encourage you. Um, they will lift you up when you're having a hard time, but wonderfully, they will be very open um, to what you're learning and they will be very eager to hear what you're contributing from your own experience. And, um, you know, I'm not just saying this because I'm on the call with Toitu, but obviously uh, Toitu, um, um, is one of those organizations. Um, and so, as I say, pick your partners very carefully. Yeah, and we tried hard to, to monitor some of that best practice, but a few fun, you know, you in the audience hear things, um, that do share them with us because we all share them, share information widely as well. So we have used almost all of our time, but um, there's a time for a few questions. That's a picture that I took uh, when I was about to leave cop one day um, of a very long building, which is probably about 200 metres long, I reckon. Um, uh, but we got a time for a few questions, which I'll just have a quick look at. Um, so we've got a question from Cam. Kia ora, Rod. You mentioned the importance of retaining our credibility as a nation on this stage. What do you think is our biggest risk in terms of losing that credibility? Is there a particular industry or issue or emission source you're worried about? Yes, methane is very rapidly rising up um, the global agenda. Uh, the global methane pledge is initially focused on oil and gas, um, but food systems are coming strongly to the fore. Um, methane is our most problematic gas. Um, and thus the response of the farming sector. Um, and um, even with the um, concessions the government made um, yesterday at field days, um, that doesn't get us a great deal closer. That is our big vulnerability. And yet um, we have the most extraordinary opportunity here um, to use land to farm to produce food in ways that very fundamentally work with nature and not against it. Um, and um, I say to farmers all the time here, I try to make the case to them, this is the greatest business opportunity you're ever going to have, but you've got to start by just parking the denial about um, your role in this and the methane, methane's role in this. That is absolutely our number one vulnerability. Um, but our second one is an overarching one. Um, we have, set ourselves uh, climate goals, we have carbon budgets, but we are real outliers um, in putting a great deal of emphasis on money in buying um, offsets that uh, or carbon reductions that other people achieve in other countries. And it's really important to separate out those two things in that it's absolutely 
desperately important that each country reduces its, its own emissions as fast as it can, because that's a sign that it's transitioning its economy um, to a deeply sustainable one that's climate compatible and everything else. And then um, still at the same time, being able to help those international um, efforts in developing countries um, to do the same themselves. You can't kind of bang the two together and say, well, we, we're not doing enough here, so we'll do it somewhere else. And, and I think um, we're along with Switzerland as being real outliers on this. Um, and I think that is um, fundamentally uh, the other big risk that we face in terms of our credibility internationally. But also at the same time, we're shooting ourselves in the foot or more fundamentally in other body parts. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, by um, that kind of approach, it is absolutely, um, our, those are our two biggest weaknesses. Thanks, Rod. Um, so, Next one, a couple of comments rather than questions. While New Zealand's a small country, we have the sixth highest emissions per capita in the OECD. Also, while voluntary carbon markets are common ground, it's still about buying offsets rather than actual emissions reduction. Um, and that's absolutely true. Um, we have to, we can't offset our way out of this. Um, we have to deeply reduce our emissions. Um, there is room for um, offsetting to some extent in the short term while we're on our way to, to those reductions because actually that's a way of funding some of these projects that will reduce emissions elsewhere. So it is a way of providing climate finance um, into often into developing countries or into projects that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, but absolutely agree that we have to um, reduce our emissions first and foremost and we can't offset our way out of this problem. Hmm. So Florence says we need to take nature's timeline. Great comment, Rod. Um, over a third of 2,000, oh, sorry, 200 largest businesses in the world have net zero carbon targets, but less than half of those have a plan to get there. Um, the New Zealand private sector reflects this position also. How can we encourage businesses to start acting on their commitments and in particular prioritising reduction? How can consumers and governments support them? For me, a lot of that's about um, holding businesses to account, you know, spending your money with the companies that are making very clear, transparent and, um, you know, real reductions. Um, Rob, you look like you were ready to say something there. Yeah, I was just going to, I was just looking to remind myself um, of the actual number. Um, to, to me, the absolute key is that, um, you have to work to science-based targets, i.e. it's climate science is telling you what your targets need to be um, and the time frame for that. Um, and um, you can derive those in various ways. Um, but for me, um, one of the best measures is whether you are signed up to SBTI, um, the global process, as memory serves only um, about 18 New Zealand companies are signed up to SBTI for one and a half degrees. Um, and that's still only signing up. You have to keep tracking them as to how they're doing. That's an extraordinarily low proportion. Um, and and um, so one of the great challenges for us but with particularly smaller um, um, businesses in New Zealand is to make sure that um, those very demanding disciplines and methodologies are accessible for much smaller businesses. So I, I think that's a particular challenge, but we can work through that. Um, but that to me, from a business point of view, is the absolute key. The other one is um, to just take hugely to heart this relationship with nature. And so in a, in a COP perspective, we've got um, the climate that we've got the climate convention, but we've also got the bio um, sphere convention, the bio um, the ecosystem convention, the biodiversity one. So we've just had COP twenty seven on climate. Um, COP fifteen resumes in Montreal next week, and, and the two conventions are coming closer and closer together. Again, that was a first for COP twenty seven, and to start to make that linkage. Um, so watch that very closely um, over the next few weeks. It's going to be a very fraught negotiations 
uh, China is technically the president of that, but um, held the first leg of that in Kunming in China last year, didn't do very well on it, uh, can't hold leg two because of COVID, so it's in Montreal. Um, that's really important, and particularly for us, because here in New Zealand, we have the largest stock of natural capital per capita of any nation in the world, except for petro states. Well, we wouldn't want to be them, we're us, we are the future, they're not. Um, and we've got to take that incredibly seriously and make that really our, our Southern Cross, our guiding star um, as we um, navigate these, you know, this unknown territory, um, these unknown seas that are ever stormier um, that we have to do. Great. Thanks, Rod. We are out of time. Um, there's a couple more questions, but um, I think that's probably four minutes over time already is probably <laughs> enough for people. Um, Rod, really appreciate your insights. Um, it's been great spending this time with you. Um, yeah, hopefully you, we keep working together and um, next COP28, Dubai next year, let's do this all again. Um, I, I already booked my flight. It is for the worst possible reason. I had, um, I'm so embarrassed about this, but I do need to confess. Um, I had some expiring Emirates miles. Um, so <laughs> I booked uh, before they expired today, uh, yesterday. Um, so I'm booked. Um, Excellent. Dubai, and um, I offset um, um, through a very credible source. Um, and I don't feel at all good about the offsets. Um, but at least some um, um, for tropical forest owners in the Pacific um, benefit from that. And that's not the solution at all. Um, but I always have to weigh up how useful can I be by being there and what do I need to get that do to get there. Um, so anyway. Yeah, absolutely. The, the decision process we go through as well. Yeah. So to close, I'll um, do a closing karakia and then we will close off the the webinar and um, thank you all for attending. I'm sorry for going slightly over time. So, ka whakairia te tapu, ki a wātea ai te ara, ki a tūruki whakataha ai, ki a tūruki whakataha ai, homie, huie, taiki. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Mas Thanks, everybody. <laughs>